continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Effner, your host on The Open Mind, and my guest today has recently accepted what in these times must be an extraordinarily challenging position, that of Dean of Columbia University's noted Graduate School of Journalism, the J School as we knew it from across the campus in my own undergraduate days at Columbia College. Historian, author, New Yorker writer, and journalist Steve Cole now takes on the ever greater challenge of pointing students the way to be a journalist, even as all things change, and we change with them. Steve Cole spent many years at the Washington Post as a general assignment feature writer, as financial correspondent, as a foreign correspondent, and the paper's South Asia bureau chief. Together with a Washington Post colleague, my guest won the 1990 Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting, eventually becoming an associate editor and then the Post's managing editor. In 2005, Steve Cole joined the writing staff of The New Yorker, based in Washington, D.C. And in 2007, he also joined the New America Foundation, resigning as its president five years later. Now it is Dean Cole. And it was about his new academic challenges that we spoke most last time. Let's continue where we left off. Uh, we were in the midst of a, uh, I had to. I think you were calling me off. hopelessly naive when we left off. <laughs> uh, naive, innocent, no, wonderfully inspiring. And I hope you inspire your students with your beliefs. But we were talking about whether journalists can work with subjects, induce them to cooperate and talk without betraying them in effect, which was the Janet Malcolm um, sort of provocation. And I think you were, I was making the case that that equation has changed a little bit because subjects now see themselves as more, are, are more aware of the way media works and you and were as challenging a, them. As an yeah. occasional subject, I was saying, <laughs> no, we're just as, uh, not innocent, yeah. but eager to speak directly to the public, and the press makes us feel we can do that. It's true, and you know there, there is a um, vanity uh, that mm -hmm. journalists recognize in in um, humanity and exploit uh, to persuade people to talk with them. But um, I think Janet Malcolm's proposition that we were talking about last time goes further, which is to say it's a form of betrayal. Now that seems to me higher um, standard um, of perfidy than, <laughs> than just playing with someone's vanity. And, and I, I, I'm, I don't accept that. I, I do recognize that there are lots of different reporters with lots of different senses of obligation to an ethical code or to their subjects. But I do believe, not out of um, my own practice, but watching others uh, very closely as an editor uh, and also as a colleague, that there are some journalists, anyway, I'm not claiming um, a particular sort of plurality, but there are some journalists who um, take their uh, relationships, their professional relationships in the course of working on very complicated subject matter, 
very, very seriously. Sometimes that involves protecting sources from disclosure. So there are journalists who have been willing to go to prison uh, to protect individuals. Sometimes it involves um, making sure that their subjects do understand the consequences of a piece of journalism before it's published. Don't ambush their subjects um, by surprising them in print in a way that they were unwilling to discuss before a story comes to print. These are important kind of ethical dilemmas that I think, for example, a journalism school should teach because there are different ways to confront the problem of naive subjects. You can just whistle past it and, and feel smug. I'm a journalist. I'm protected by the First Amendment. This is my sucker. Or you can do something harder, which is actually wrestle with the problem that sometimes people disclose information in ways that they're not aware will have consequences for them as individuals or professionally and wrestle with that as part of the process. I find journalism born of that willingness to, t to take on the ethical problems is actually much richer, lasts longer, and is more credible in the, in the eyes of readers. I have another question. Uh, I don't know how you will react to this. So frequently when journalists are my guests here, sit where you're sitting, I ask whether they don't think of themselves as having the responsibility of the historian. And most usually, I should disclose to you, most frequently, almost always, I say absolutely not. No relationship or very little relationship between the journalist and the historian. How do you feel about yeah, well, that? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm embrace that border land, that sort of liminal space, and that's where I've tried to work. It's where I wanted to work when I came out of school many moons ago. I you know, read history as an undergraduate and, and wanted to write the kinds of works of narrative nonfiction that, that strayed into um, the sort of aspirations of academic history and tried to meet their standards of, of evidence and argument and presentation. So. I embraced that. I worked at a newspaper where I think Bob Woodward or Ben Bradley, one of them famously said that newspapers are the first draft of history, which seemed to some people a kind of a grand claim, just even first draft. Uh, but, but they are. But they are. And they're often wrong uh, as a first draft, uh, which then raises, the, the, and this is the purpose for associating oneself with the kind of s the aspirations of historians, which is that uh, it seems a, to me a good historian um, is skeptical about any particular body of evidence and is looking to synthesize as many bodies of evidence about a subject as possible and to constantly uh, sort of interrogate what a person may claim to remember or what a document may claim to represent about a meeting, not to accept any one source as definitive. And in fact, it seems to me historiography, the, the revision of history, is about continually rediscovering what was limited in earlier drafts of history. So now, on deadline, if you're working on a real-time television broadcast, it's very difficult to get past the first body of evidence. What can we see? What is somebody telling us credibly as an eyewitness? Let's just get that right. At a newspaper, you, you, you can do more than that. You can put the paper to bed one day and then go back at the same subject the next day and the next month and the next year if it's of public importance. And as a book author or a magazine writer, you can go much further than that, which is to say, what about the public record that newspapers and broadcast media has created about this important subject is incomplete? What can I um, take advantage of the time and the resources that I'm privileged to possess to illuminate that was missed the first time around. And that's what takes you towards the aspirations, at least, of, of, of professional historians. What about the uh, newspapers themselves or the, the contemporary news reporters? Maybe calling them newspapers will soon be uh, out of style. And their revision, the continuing revision of a story. Now, I know uh, my father used to send me out at 8 o'clock in the evening to pick up the first editions of the newspapers. And I know that you could go out at 11 o'clock and get the next editions. And the next morning, 
that some stories could be totally different. How, how well do you think we handle our ability now using the web constantly to change things? Well, there's not much transparency for readers about corrections and changes that have been made, and I, I find my, that frustrating myself. The Times does a pretty good job of pointing out significant updates or corrections uh, in web editions. They take more of the kind of edition-based approach um, to revision that you're recalling than most outlets. But when you read uh, information, eyewitness information or breaking news information on the web, you often um, are at a loss as to when um, corrections have been made, whether the thrust of a story has been reversed on the basis of new information, and you're sort of on your own with that. Um, you know, I do think that uh, newspaper editioning, even under the extraordinary pressure of time that a daily cycle creates, did have a, um, a beneficial effect. And I don't think I'm just being nostalgic or <laughs> sort of extrapolating my own experience into some larger truth. It, it, because there is an intersection. And one thing, if you've ever been in a newsroom on, on a deadline, whether you're calling a state uh, on the night of a presidential election, uh, is Florida red or blue? Uh, there is a fixed time when all of the best uh, information and the best reporters and editors and experienced political analysts, people who have called Florida right and wrong through previous president, they all gather around and they've got 20 minutes to make a decision, yes or no. You get a better judgment out of the discipline of editioning than I think you get out of the sense that the world is continuous. If we make a mistake, we'll just paper it over and change the paragraph and move on. And uh, so it's not, um, it's, the, it's the professional culture that's associated with finishing something that I think um, is challenging in a, broad, in a continuous broadcasting environment. You see it in live broadcasting. And you know, there was a day when the networks, um, with their privileged positions, their strong business models, their big budgets, their license spectrum, they worked very hard to try to define excellence in that continuous environment. Um, and very rarely, they would rather be right than first, um, was a lot of the ethic in that era. And today, today um, it would be you'd be hard pressed to make the case that even a strong, strongly branded networks whose businesses depend on their credibility and, and their reputations, you know, that they that they have distributed down the chain of their newsrooms that sense we'd rather be right than first. I think the the uh, ethos today is much more. Uh, let's try to be first, and if we make a mistake, we'll correct it honestly and move on. That's the sort of response you see now, there's not a lot of um, perceived consequence to these mistakes. People like us will call them out and, and express dismay, but are there really um, consequences to being wrong in a big way anymore? I'm not well, sure. that does raise the question, for me at least, of a national news council. How have you felt about that in the past? I mean, the, the council's birth and demise, I suspect, came before your time. It did, yes. I was talking to somebody just the other day who... Uh, old been, enough to remember. Old enough to remember had been involved in its birth and passing. I'm skeptical about um, these kinds of bodies um, because uh, in the past I've been skeptical about them because I wasn't sure what value they added to the self-regulation that these quasi-monopolistic uh, licensed, quasi-licensed entities like the broadcast networks and the major newspapers were doing themselves. Um, and, you know, there is a, a danger um, that these well-intentioned self-regulating bodies can start to creep out of their original mission over time into, into other forms of censorship and, and control. Um, but what I think is required now to a greater degree than five or 10 years ago is a serious national conversation about uh, the kinds of ethical questions and, and practices that, um, that such a council would take on because those 
um, subjects are, um, are now much more contested and much less honored than they were even five or ten years ago. Explain so, that. I, I don't well, understand that. Well, I think, look, when I was starting out at the Washington Post um, in 1985, the question of um, what uh, was ethical conduct by a reporter for a professional news organization um, was a very mature subject in the newsroom. I got a handbook that told me all kinds of things that I could and could not do while I declared myself to be a reporter for the Washington Post. I could not walk into, I could not trespass, uh, certainly not without the approval of the general counsel of the Washington Post company. If I walked into an open meeting as a Washington Post reporter and didn't announce myself and you came up to me and said, who are you? I was not allowed to lie. I had to say I work for the Washington Post uh, and so on. I could go down the handbook and, and I spent uh, you know, much of my first year being schooled about these practices. Now, these would be subjects that a National News Council would take an interest in. My point is that in those days, it, such a council would have been superfluous because of the self-regulating professional cultures that had grown up in newspapers and newsrooms. Today, I'm not so sure. The question is, what, where would you house such a beast? What institutions would support it? How would it establish its credibility and legitimacy? Because ultimately, if it doesn't reach the people who are coming to graduate school of journalism at Columbia University or who are out uh, working as self-appointed reporters on the front lines of the, you know, the, the Boston bombings a few weeks ago and tweeting you know, live feeds into blogs that are publishing them. If you don't have a, a form of that um, kind of standard setting or at least debate and, and discourse about what professional journalism is that reaches those people, then, you know, it's just an exercise in, in kind of nostalgia. It, the, the form of the discourse has to be relevant to where journalists are today. And today, uh, are they at a place where you believe the school of journalism uh, can have an impact, I'm, an effect? I'm, I'm completely committing my professional life to that proposition. And I think, uh, you know, Columbia is in a great position to make a difference in this. Uh, you have 400 plus self-selecting college graduates coming to one of America's great universities for the sole purpose of uh, studying and advancing themselves and thinking about uh, themselves as journalists at a time when that profession is in uh, flux to be kind about it, is in crisis in some uh, respects where the path to institutional uh, careers that I enjoyed uh, that was available to J school graduates in, in 1980 or even 1990 looks much more uncertain. And yet here they are, highly qualified, uh, applying in droves to get into this program. I can't wait to meet them. Who are they? Why do they, why do they want to be journalists in a world where they can't be guaranteed civil service careers at big newspapers or television networks where they may even have to invent their own employment uh, when they come out of school by innovating or, or finding some way to create a new model uh, at a time when the world is still trying to figure out what forms of journalism um, will pay for themselves. Who are these kids? They are motivated by, presumably, uh, the role that other journalists have played in our society, in our democracy, and, 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 in, and frankly, there's one thing about journalism that hasn't changed. It's still a thrilling way to live. I mean, it is such a great life. You are out there in the middle of history with a notebook and a pen or a camera or a video recorder or a Twitter phone, <laughs> and, uh, you are, and you are in the middle of great events, trying to document them, trying to interpret them, or you are digging in courthouses uh, on the trail of something important, um, the misuse of power, the abuse of, uh, you know, the environment, the, the failure of institutions to serve the citizens that they are meant to serve. All of these subjects are, it's a great privilege to, to live as a journalist. When I was a foreign correspondent, every six weeks I'd be in some situation where I would turn to the person next to me and, and spontaneously say, you know, they pay me to do this. <laughs> it ought to be a crime that they pay me to do this. It's such, it's, uh, such a thrill. Now, when you become an editor, um, it's not quite the same. 
I then find myself turning to the person next to me and say, they don't pay me enough to go to this meeting. <laughs> but <laughs> that's and when your copy is received and printed or disseminated in whatever way electronically, and some ombudsperson has a comment, what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, a good, it's good for journalists to be disciplined by criticism because, in fact, um, in comparison to other professions, and uh, you know, I use that word advisedly, um, journalists you know, have an enormous scope uh, in our constitutional system to do things their way to make their own decisions, to make their own consequential choices about what to publish, uh, what not to publish. And um, they are not accountable in the way that some other professions are accountable. Um, lawyers and doctors are disciplined, for example, by litigation without the benefit of the Sullivan Standard to protect them from, from mistakes. Do you think uh, it will continue to be that way? I think our constitutional system will endure absent, you know, some terrible crisis in our nation's history. Yeah, I do think that um, the that a remarkable consensus, and really, I mean, it's been tested by by so many uh, errors and and problems uh, in our media, um, but a remarkable cross-party consensus uh, around the First Amendment standards that have grown up since uh, Sullivan. Uh, seems to be in place. Now you see in the Obama administration some encroachment on that uh, in these prosecutions in national security cases. Um, you saw after uh, September 11th a kind of informal pressure on journalism to, um, to mute itself and to mute criticism and there has always been um, a tension between government and the press around uh, the press's willingness uh, to follow national consensus as perceived in any time of crisis and so forth. But that's journalism's failure. That's not the government's failure. And it's, it certainly wasn't a, well, the, the, if, if journalism um, missed an opportunity uh, to um, hold the Bush administration to account as it planned the Iraq war without announcing that it was planning the Iraq war, uh, it, that missed opportunity was not because it was um, constrained by encroachments on the First Amendment. I mean, that was that was a failure okay. of that was a failure of leadership. It was a failure of journalism. Um, so I, we have the most permissive environment for journalism in the world. And if you go uh, anywhere in Europe as a journalist, as I you know fortunate to do sometimes, and you try to do the kind of investigative work that. Uh, is routine for journalists in the United States, working in courthouses, working with public records, uh, filing Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, knocking on the doors of government ministers and asking them uncomfortable questions, exploring sensitive classified information uh, in the public interest. Uh, the scope for journalistic activity in the United States is so much greater uh, and, than anywhere else. But you yourself have said, and you have written about the fact that this has been true but one might look at the last few years and say it is getting less and less true. I'm, I'm concerned about the Obama administration's uh, record of prosecuting national security cases um, by taking advantage essentially of uh, what it appears to be that they're taking advantage of the Patriot Act and other post 9-11 um, uh, permissions that have been granted to the government to carry out sur electronic surveillance, essentially, of government officials. And they're, they're scooping up um, electronic evidence involving interactions between government officials and journalists and using those to prosecute uh, government officials, sometimes using the Espionage Act and other draconian laws. How do you explain this? It's complicated. I don't believe that it is I think President Obama thinks that leaks are a problem. Every sitting president thinks leaks are a problem. Indeed. So he sends a little signal to his uh, Justice Department, leaks are a problem. Um, but that's about as far as he gets involved. The Justice Department has a national security division uh, that um, is responsible for investigating these kinds of cases. They bring the cases to a certain stage of ripeness. 
because of these changes in the way evidence is available to them, they have better cases than they did in the era before email because they can collect this email surreptitiously and make cases on the basis of that. They kick it up to the Attorney General. Now, the Attorney General is where the rubber meets the road. The, the Attorney General could exercise prosecu prosecutorial discretion and say to the National Security Division, you know what, this is a good case on paper, but in my judgment, the public interest associated with a permissive First Amendment environment for whistleblowers trumps your particular case. I'm not going to bring this as a felony. If you want to bring an administrative proceeding against this person or strip him of his security clearance, it's fine. He, he crossed a line, but I'm not going to bring a felony. But he's not been saying that. He's not that. been saying that. He's not been saying that. And I, I am puzzled um, that the Obama administration has tolerated this pattern um, because it is now send it has a momentum of its own at this stage. It's so puzzling to me though, uh, uh, Steve, that that you want not to point a finger at the president. I mean this is not a naive uh, person who has not been trained in, in the law. Well, it's uh, his attorney general. I think that's the that's the mechanism he has. It's, it's inappropriate, I, I would say, for a president to reach into the Justice Department's professional prosecutions, whether it's at the National Security Division or anywhere else, and say, bring that case, don't bring that case. Nixon did that. We don't want presidents doing that. But the way the president sets policy around these questions is through his uh, relationship with his attorney general. And if he d and the attorney general requires a certain amount of prosecutorial independence, but if the president is unhappy with the pattern, and he should replace his attorney general. In that sense, I agree with you. It's his responsibility because it's his attorney general. What was it that Marine Dowd uh, wrote recently? There's no bully in the pulpit. Uh, well, the opposite has to be true here. There must be a bully somewhere there if this keeps happening. And certainly, a few of you in the press have made it known to the rest of us, the reading audience, as to what's happening. Yeah, this, it really is anomalous what the Obama administration has done. Some of these prosecutions germinated in the Bush administration, it's true, but more than two-thirds, I think, of the historical cases of government officials being prosecuted for leaking to the press have occurred just in the Obama administration. And I'm told I have to say goodbye. Thank you so much for joining me it's today, my pleasure. Steve Cole. I promise to come back. I will. Okay. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time here on The Open Mind. And meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit The Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.